Hello, and thank you for tuning in to McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougal. I'm their daughter and your host. And tonight, just like every night, we will try to get through as many questions as possible. But first, I wanted to say hi to you, mom and dad, Dr. McDougal and Mary. How are you? Hi. Well, we're doing fine, except for a new camera. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be able to figure you know, it out. No, just, just you know, a few minutes. I thought I had this new camera all figured out, but forget it. You know That's what it. happens whenever you get something new? Yeah, well, anyway, <laughs> hopefully the audio is okay. I'm not really as purple as I fear to be. Well, and the camera keeps moving, so it'll be a little entertaining for everyone. <laughs> Technology is okay. great until it doesn't work, right? Yeah. Anyway, we, we at least have the show going, right? <laughs> yeah. We do. All right. Okay. All right. So I know you wanted to get started talking about a few things, share your screen, share some slides. You know, Heather, I'm, go I'm going to um, I'm going to do start out at five o'clock sessions every Sunday night a little differently because I get really excited about uh, about different topics like you know, a while back, I wanted to talk to you about the breast cancer business and, you know, the fact that there was a new study out that showed that adding radiation to a lumpectomy doesn't improve survival. You know, I, uh, you know, I had this whole discussion on colonoscopy that I was really excited about. I was reading the papers and I didn't have any slides or I didn't have any detailed discussion for you about, uh, you know, about this particular interest I have. Oh, so you so, put a little show together this So week? I decided to do a monologue. You know how they do on late night TV? Of course, yeah. late night TV isn't working too good. <laughs> anyway, could I have the, um, could I have the, uh, let's see if we can make the right here. There's the share right button. Yeah, I know, but you know what? You have all these problems I've had. Oh, okay. Just another We're only going to, uh, <laughs> we're probably going to goof around for a few minutes right? Well, I don't even know what you're going to talk about, so I'm excited too. Well, well, you know, it's something that he's been working on all week. Well, the first thing you have to you have to understand is that uh, is that the heart surgery doesn't save lives, and I've talked to you about that in great detail. Uh, this includes bypass surgery as well as angioplasty. You know, if you want to look at all the research papers done, you know, that were done up until that point, I've been adding some new ones recently. All show the same thing, and that is. When you do heart surgery, what you do is you operate on old scars. And the consequence is that people don't live any longer because it's not old scars that kill. It's, it's pustules that pop that kill. So if you uh, are of the understanding that heart surgery doesn't save lives, then um, you have to ask, well, why would you do heart surgery? Well, the indication for heart surgery that every medical student was taught, I was taught it 50 years ago, they're taught it today, is incapacitating chest pain unrelieved by good medical therapy. Now, what I want to show you was, there we go, was incapacitating chest pain on, on uh, what good medical therapy is all about. Why, why did you happen to think about this this week? Something new come out? Well, you know, I was actually I was reading the old papers, Mary. Okay. Uh, I, was, I was reading old papers that I'd, uh, uh, you know that that I read, you know, many many years ago, and and I and I got interested in going back and reviewing this stuff. And just because something's old doesn't mean it's not really good. You know, you have to understand that there were really smart people back fifty years ago, or seventy years ago, a hundred years ago. They worked with the technology that they had, and they discovered basic things. And the orientation back then, fifty years ago, or seventy years ago, was primarily for the patient. You know, that, that's, that's, what, that's what doctors are interested in, science scientists were interested in, is helping the patients. But what happened since uh, the 1980s, early 1980s, is that, that the pharmaceutical, the food industries, the hospital industries, the doctor industries, figured that that shouldn't be the goal, is to make the patient healthier. What we need to do is sell drugs, sell more procedures, and, you know, well, I'm Don't, sure that's not what they really thought. That's what, that's what the end result was, but they couldn't have been that. Well, then why, Tell did, us, why, did, they, why did they continue to pursue uh, uh, efforts? Yeah, that's right. Why did they continue to pursue these efforts? Can you see you know, what I'm showing here? Yes. All right, let's see if we can get a picture. All right. 
So uh, what happens is a low fat diet. Oh, now, now, Dad, I see your whole slideshow screen. I don't know if you want to show that. That's okay. Okay. That's okay. That's good enough. As long as they can see it. <laughs> okay. You don't need to look at my purple tinge on my new camera. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, the most powerful chest pain relieving therapy there is was discovered over 70 years ago. Now, okay, the, 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 the correct way to take care of a heart patient is this. You have chest pain, you go to the doctor, you tell the doctor you've had chest pain. The questions that are asked are, is this incapacitating chest pain? Does it keep you from doing the things you want to do? Do you think they really ask people that? No, they don't. They go okay. right, into, right into heart surgery, Mary. All right. They, they go right into, you've got to see the heart, the heart surgery, you've got to see the cardiologist, you've got to have heart surgery. And as I started out telling you, is I, you know, I've showed you all the studies on angioplasty and open heart bypass surgery, and they don't save lives. And the reason is, is because these surgeries operate on old scars, hard fibrous plaques. They don't operate on the part of the disease that kills, which is when a plaque ruptures, it forms a blood clot. All right, so we can go into that discussion later about how heart surgery doesn't save lives. So what's the indication for doing heart surgery? It's incapacitating chest pain, unrelieved by good medical therapy. All students are taught that. That's the dictum. That's what everybody knows. But you're right, Mary, they go off to heart <laughs> surgery. Okay. So, so anyway, uh, good, good, uh, good medical therapy, or uh, chest pain unrelieved by good medical therapy. Well, for most doctors, good medical therapy is beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and nitroglycerin pills to relieve the chest pain. If you can control the chest pain adequately, there's no reason to go on to heart surgery because heart surgery doesn't save lives. It, it best relieves chest pain. All right, now let me get to the point of this discussion I'm trying to give you, is the most powerful anti-anginal therapy. They have been around for over 70 years. And that has to do with the effect of what you eat and what we're talking about is high fat foods, what you eat on your circulation. You see the blood cells here on the left-hand side of the slide, they're, they're kind of sticking together in clumps. And as a result, they get stuck in narrow passages. And as a result, not much blood gets through to the right-hand side of the slide. So as a result, your heart develops pain. You follow me up to that yeah, point? Okay, okay. You, got it. you got blood that's trying to get through that narrowing. Yeah. You get chest pain, all right. So what you want to do is you want to prevent these blood cells from aggregating, from, from getting stuck in the blood vessel. Is that what those little white things are, fat balls? They could be. I didn't even look at those. So those might be white blood cells too. Or white. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I thought they were fat gloves. What we're talking about next is we're going to be talking about oxygen tension, the amount of oxygen in your blood. And I know many of you know about this because you've been encouraged or you, you've run across this particular meter which is a, uh, an, oxygen, uh, an oxygen meter, which you see over here on the right. There are all kinds of brands out. They cost about $30. And they tell you your oxygen saturation, how much oxygen is in your blood. All right. So you're up with me on that so far. So this is a good thing to have, one of these things? Well, you could check it. I mean, particularly if, if you're having problems with your lungs. Okay. Or you wonder whether a high fat meal has caused you to have a reduction in oxygen tension, which is what I'm going to show you right now. Okay. Thank you. All right. So here's a, a, a serious uh, motion picture about what happens. Let's see if we, oh, this is not so much. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was coming up next. Uh, here's, here's one of the basic studies that was done. It was done by a guy named Friedman and another fellow by the name of Williams. And it was done. In uh, you know the 1950s, early 1960s, and you see the references down in the what would be the right-hand corner, and you can look those up. I showed you how to do it. In fact, maybe I'll go back and before I put the slide presentation and show you how to look up the studies yourself. Anyway, what they did in this particular experiment is they took people who had a tendency towards heart disease. Well, what American doesn't have a tendency towards heart disease? when your risk of dying of heart disease or a stroke is close to 50% in your lifetime. So they took these otherwise healthy people, which were, I would say, pretty typical Americans. And then what they did is they fed them a diet that contained 67% of the calories as fat. When you look down here below the, uh, the pictures of the eye, eye the conjunctiva here, 
And you see that meant two eggs, four strips of bacon, milk, cream, bread, and two pats of butter. Okay, so they, they put a microscope over the whites of this man's eye. And by the way, if you look up the scientific paper on this, which was published in circulation in 1964, you will see a whole bunch of examples. This is just one of the people. They fed him one meal, a breakfast, that had 67% of the calories as fat, which consisted of two eggs, four strips of bacon, milk, cream, bread, two cats of butter. Have you ever eaten that breast breakfast? I bet you have. And anyways, what happened is the blood cells stuck together in clumps. And you see here, this is a picture, uh, I guess my, is on your left-hand side, the before picture, you see there's lots of thick blood vessels, all right? Many, many blood vessels. And that was before the meal. And then you look at the after picture on the right-hand side, you see the dramatic reduction in circulation. Can well, you, you see that, Mary? To, well, you have to tell them it's the same part of the eye. It's the same part of the <laughs> eye. Vessels have disappeared. Why? Because vessel walls are transparent. And the only reason you could see the blood vessels is because red blood cells, opaque red blood cells are going through. Okay, once the blood cells stop going through the blood vessel, they disappear. Okay. All right, so what you see in here is a whole bunch of blood vessels that have disappeared. In other words, you're seeing a dramatic reduction in the circulation, which occurs not in just the whites of the eye, which is what this man is looking at through the microscope, yeah. but all of the entire body, the brain, the heart, you know, the muscles, your toes, every place, you get this particular phenomenon occurring. Now, let's see what happens next. All right, you're stuck right there. Right. There you go. Okay, so uh, experiments done. This was done by Peter Cole. And what they did is they took uh, four, they, they took people, again, they were typical Americans, uh, maybe on the tendency towards a higher risk of dying of heart disease. They had higher cholesterols, higher. Uh, well, look at how long ago they did this. I know that was from 1955. Okay, but what they did is they fed these 14 people. They fed them a fatty meal consisting of heavy cream, okay, 40% butter fat, cocoa, and uh, to make it taste good, to make it eat it, because you can't eat fat. It's mm -hmm. just too disgusting. They had to put a sugar substitute in it, which is they put. Uh, oh, so they didn't want to have anything that was sugar. Yeah, because they wanted it high fat, high fat. low carbohydrate, right. Okay, and then they had a control group. Uh, they fed the people a low-fat meal, same volume, same number of calories. Yeah. So it filled the stomach the same way because people used to believe, Mary, that the reason you got chest pain after you ate was because the blood went through the intestinal tract. It was deprived of the heart. Oh, I heard that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and we've, we've known for thousands of years, certainly for hundreds of years, that people who have a tendency towards heart disease, in other words, kings and queens and aristocrats and Americans, they get chest pain after their meals. It was blamed on the blood being diverted to the intestinal tract. Well, well, isn't that why they used to tell you not to go swimming after you ate? Well, that has to do with a bunch of cramps. Don't get into that. <laughs> okay. okay, so Peter Quo took these 14 individuals and fed them a single meal that was high fat. And he, he developed 14 attacks, angina attacks, chest pain. In six of the in four, in, uh, in six of the people, six of the fourteen people, fourteen typical uh, attacks. Now look over here on the <coughs> over here on the chart. Oh, my! Uh, you see my little arrow there, Heather? Yeah, it's just tiny. <laughs> yeah, it's really tiny. It's really yeah. tiny. We got a lot of work to do on this presentation. <laughs> all right, you see the X's here. All right, yeah. the X's are anginal attacks, in other words, chest pain. In other words, the things that you're trying to get rid of because heart surgery doesn't save lives. So four people got it? Does that mean? Well, there's four attacks in one person. Oh, okay. Okay, he had four, four attacks in one person. Yeah. All right, so anyway, uh, they proved that high fat meals cause chest pain. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have an, an ideal treatment for people who have a serious artery disease and uh, have an indication for heart surgery, which is chest pain, unrelieved by good medical therapy. Right. Hopefully you're following so hard. Well, I'm just trying to figure out what you're getting to. Okay. Well, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna quit right here. We'll do better next time. Okay. Well, well, I mean, was there a point you were just trying to show people that for 50 years, they've known that high fat meals cause chest pain? 
Yeah. And instead of that, they just operate on people? No, I don't know what happened with the slide presentation here. I'm going to try one more time. I don't think you should. I think I should quit. I think you should mind. quit. Well, yeah. <laughs> we need to. Well, you're slightly time. behind. <laughs> <laughs> really? All right, here you go. Okay. Here's, here's what happens when you eat a high fat diet. You see the blood cells falling by very quickly, lots of good flow. You feed the fat, all right? Just like they did in this experiment. You feed the fat, you develop high fat in the blood, the fat coats the blood cells. They can't repel each other anymore. This is rapid flow. This is before the sludging occurs. What happens when you feed the oils and fats is the blood cells get coated and then they don't repel, they stick with each other. You see how, how you slow the circulation? You drop the oxygen tension. Remember I showed you that little machine. You drop the oxygen tension between four and 15%. It's oxygen you need to go to the heart to prevent the chest pain. All right. So anyway, this, this happens, uh, this sludgy phenomenon lasts for about 10 hours. In other words, the typical American has sludge blood all day long. Unless they're sleeping. Okay. And I just want to do this, this work with Peter Cole with you. Yeah. See if we can pull on another one. No, I think we need to go on to questions. I don't know why in the world this is going to <laughs> That's uh, why I'm saying. All right. Oh, all right. Well, Heather, I, I quit. <laughs> I wanted to show you a couple other slides, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the point being is that is that um, it's, it's just money. <laughs> you know, it's a matter of people. Uh, uh, you know, you're being cared for by people who are more concerned about making money. The drug companies, your doctors, the hospitals, uh, then they are concerned about you getting well. Well. If they were really concerned about you, you getting well, they wouldn't be pushing heart surgery on you, which does not save lives. They wouldn't be pushing drugs on you that cost money, have serious side effects. They wouldn't be doing that to you. If you were the only one that was of interest here, they'd be relying upon work that was done by Cole and Williams and Friedman, you know, back 70, 80 years ago. It's just as true today as it was back then. These were great researchers. In fact, you know, the amount of money it would take to do a well-designed study, you know, a randomized control trial, whatever, the best studies available would be infinitesimal compared to what they spent on getting a single drug ready for market. Anyway, I'm going to try this next week too. I'm going <laughs> to give you the topic I've been interested in. I wanted to show you Peter Quo's work. And, well, you just did. Yeah, I did. I showed you that, didn't I? Yeah. Anyway. I stopped your screen sharing. I hope that's okay. You know, probably take, you can you through some <laughs> Going through slides here. And well, I, I can't figure this out. Why my whole slideshow got screwed up? I better get some. You, you better get yourself. All right. Me... Okay, I'm back. Okay, you ready for some questions? I think so. All right, here we go. This is from Evan. Should the potassium levels in whole grains, as opposed to refined grains, be of concern to someone following a renal diet? I'd have to look it up. Okay, I, I would suspect they're not a different enough that whole grains and refined grains would make a big deal of difference, but you could easily look that up. You could look up the potassium content because what you're concerned about is potassium. Okay, when you, have, when you have kidney disease, the primary effort that your doctor knows, your, your nephrologist knows this. And in fact, you ask them, the primary Thing that you can do to preserve your kidney function is to eat a low-protein diet. All right, so how do you eat a low-protein diet? Well, you get the high-protein foods out of your diet, which is chicken and fish and beef and pork and, you know, isolated soy protein foods and even beans, peas, and lentils, which are high in protein. All right, well, you know, we've got to get calories from someplace. So where do you get calories from? Well, you need to get them from starch, but you've got to be careful when you lose over 90 to 95% of your kidney function. When you only have between five and 10% of your kidney left, that, that means 90% is gone. Then what happens is the body has an inability to handle potassium. Then you have to start looking for low potassium foods, which means fruits and vegetables, they have to be minimized. And you start looking for low potassium starches and those are your grains, corn, wheat, rice, your grains are low potassium. I just, I just looked that up. What? The difference in potassium in brown rice and white rice. Yeah. Um, potassium is 
85 milligrams per cup um, in brown rice. Right. And it's 55 in white rice. So I don't know how much difference that makes. Well, I don't I don't think it's going to be crucial. It, when you get down to only 5% of your kidney function left, they're going to be talking to you about things like transplant or dialysis for sure. But what we want to do is we want to take, 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 take people who have only lost you know, 75% of their kidney function or 50% of their kidney function. All you have to have is 25% of your kidneys functioning to clear all the waste from your body. You can have, as I've just told you, with potassium, you have to lose as much as 90 to 95% of your kidney mass before you start having troubles with potassium. And that's why you, you, you don't eat vegetables like underground storage oils, like potatoes and sweet potatoes. Instead, you must get your energy from someplace. Well, you get it from grains as opposed to potatoes and sweet potatoes. However, let me just add one more caveat here. What is the ultimate low protein? Remember, protein causes wear and tear in the kidneys. What is the ultimate in low protein, in low potassium food? Sugar. Sugar. It's not really food. It's, it's <laughs> white sugar, table yeah, sugar. <laughs> and, and that's why somebody with that series of disease, I recommend that they add table sugar to their diet to get energy because you're, you're being kind to the kidneys. You're, you're putting the body in a situation where it has a minimal amount of of metabolism that has to accomplish. I know white sugar rots teeth. I know white sugar raises triglycerides. I know you think white sugar makes you overweight. It doesn't. <laughs> but it, you know we're talking about extremely ill people. But unfortunately, this kind of recommendation to eat a healthy diet is never. I think I can say that. I haven't met a patient in 50 years of practice who has been educated by their kidney doctor to eat a healthy diet. I've never seen well, it happen. Probably because anyone who's been educated by their doctor in eating a healthy diet is not coming to you because they can't get well. They're already well. It doesn't happen there. Yeah, no, I know. So you know, well, I was being kind. <laughs> yeah, when I when I say that my colleagues are, are, have, have missed the boat and are uh, not taking care of their customers. You, I always got you and Heather to pipe in and say, well, there are exceptions. There are lots of good doctors. And so I know there are a lot of good doctors out there. And there are a lot of good drugs, too. And there are a lot of good, there's a lot of good devices. There are a lot of wonderful things. But for the vast majority of problems that you and your family suffer from, it's malpractice. And you know it because you're not getting well. And you're still too fat, obese, and overweight. You still have high blood pressure. You still have diabetes. You're still constipated. Why? Because you haven't you haven't gotten involved. Well, the solution, the solution is a starch-based diet. It always works. You know, we're not talking about something that's, that sometimes works. It always works. And how fast does it work? Well, we run a 12-day program. You know, next one's going to be in July. And within 12 days, uh, our participants are off all unnecessary medication, which is about 90% of the drugs that they take. They understand exactly what they do. They've accomplished most of what they need to accomplish in terms of laboratory improvements, drops in cholesterol, improvements in triglycerides, blood sugars, et cetera, within 12 days. The only thing they haven't accomplished in 12 days is all the weight they want to lose. And the weight goes at somewhere between eight and 14 pounds a month. So if you've got you know, 200 pounds of weight to lose, do the math. It's gonna take you a while longer, but otherwise, if you're looking to just get well, you'll start getting well within four to seven days. And by 12 days, especially if you spend time with us and we give you the right kind of direction, you'll be on the road to recovery. You will be a non-patient quickly or a minimal patient quickly. That's our goal is to get you out of the medical business. And as I told you a hundred times before, I'll say it again, give this approach four months. If you're not well within four months, I'll admit that you're not going to get well. And you ought to go listen to somebody else. But give us at least a few days. The program's free on the website, drmcdougal.com. But we're there to help you. We've got medical advice, the best there. Dr. Lim, our medical director, is a board-certified family practitioner who, by the way, is the second leading expert in the world on diet therapy, Dr. Lim is. 
the second. Uh, yeah, we're not saying. I'm not telling you who the first is. <laughs> but uh, okay. we, we will help you get well. Go on, next question. Okay, next question. Can we talk? This is from Lisa. Can we talk about hereditary or high cholesterol that's hereditary? Yeah, it happens sometimes. There's family tendencies that are. Uh, in other words, uh, just like there are family tendencies to have heart attacks and strokes and other families get cancer and some have a tendency to obesity. There, there is some genetic makeup involved here. But it, it's such that heart attacks are 100% preventable unless you have what we call homozygous hypercholesterolemia or maybe heterozygous hypercholesterolemia where you have a genetic defect. You know, almost everybody out there, like 4,999 of you don't have this genetic de defect. Only one in 5,000 people has it. Or maybe- Well, maybe, that's a lot of people. There are a lot of people in the country or in the world. A lot of people in the world. But most of, our, most of the people are listening to us, Mary. They, <laughs> they don't they've got cholesterol of, you know, 200, 250, 300, 350. These are people who have cholesterol of 1,000. You know, they, 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 they die of heart disease when they're 20. So, you know, we're not talking about hereditary hypercholesterolemia in most cases. You may have a family tendency. And if that's all it is, it's 100% preventable. Why do I know this? Because heart disease was non-existent until people switched from a starch-based diet. But didn't occur. what about people that follow the diet strictly and you know they do? Yeah. And they still can't get their cholesterol to go back past 150. Well, Mary, you know, most. So, of I mean, what about people that are like between 150 and 200? Did I mention you have to start this starch based diet when you're a kid? <laughs> you know, so, problem, so, that could be why. Yeah, the problem is, is that we, with cholesterol is stored, it's stored in your tendons. And by the way, I found a great article this morning on xanthelasma which is where you have cholesterol deposits in your skin and your tendons. you got these big nodules of cholesterol deposits, xanthelasma it's called. On your outside of your yeah, body? Outside of the skin, like you have like 50 of them on your buttocks of these nodules. I've never seen that. No, no, okay. And then on your tendons, it's oh. called xanthelasma, X-A-N-T-H-A-L-S-E-M-I-A. -S -E xanthelasma, found a great article this morning, back it was done by the same people who were working in the 50s who were treating people with xanthelasma with the same diet that you stop the angina with, same diet you reverse the atherosclerosis with, completely cleared up. They went away? Completely. Oh, okay. you know, and I'll be glad to share that people with any of you. But now getting back to what mom was saying, there is a group of usually women that follow a whole right. plant-based diet, do everything right, yet their cholesterols are like, you know, above 200. Yeah, that's... I, I can think of a couple of people that, and you know, you know, Roberta. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Who had cholesterols in the 350 range, who had that really strong tendency. She still wasn't, she wasn't uh, the, the genetic defect yet, but, but her cholesterols were in 350. She couldn't take the statins or wouldn't take them. And I, by the way, I encourage her to take them. And uh, we've studied her and we've done this with uh, several other of our patients who run cholesterols in the 350 range, we've done heart scans on them, which is the most innocuous way to look at the arteries directly. It's an X-ray machine, a CAT scan, takes a whole bunch of X-rays, puts them together in a computer program, and you can basically look at your heart and the blood vessels and the blockages through this scan. It's amazing technology. Well, we've done these follow-up scans on people who, for one reason or another, were worried, couldn't take the statins, ate strictly, still had cholesterol at 350 and they needed some reassurance. Baby clean, just absolutely as clean as a whistle, so they say. You know, it's, uh, it was surprising, but we see it over and over again. The point being, let me add one more thing. Uh, Dean Orange, you know, his reversal of heart disease studies, the Dean reports that changes in cholesterol were not tied very directly to changes in, in, in artery lesions. In other words, even though you dropped your cholesterol, you know, didn't necessarily see improvement or reversal of atherosclerosis. The correlation with whether or not you saw reversal of atherosclerosis in Dean Orange's studies was how adherent you were to the diet. 
Not what happened to your cholesterol, but how it turned toward a diet. You see, cholesterol is just a marker. Nobody dies of high cholesterol. It's, 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 it's just a marker. It's just animal products contain cholesterol. So if you eat a lot of animals, you end up accumulating a lot of cholesterol in your body. And, uh, you know, it, it's just a marker. But the problem is, is if you nourish your arteries with food that doesn't have, you know, the right amount of nutrients in it, it's got too much oxidized cholesterol, too much fat, too much environmental contaminants. You know, I have to, I have to spend a lifetime telling you about the problems of Western diet. And I have, <laughs> and you know, it's uh, and with the right, with the correctness of a, of a diet based on starch, fruits, and vegetables, you know, high fiber, high in phytonutrients, high in antioxidants, uh, no cholesterol, low fat. So, Are, you, so you would say if somebody had a, a higher cholesterol, but if everything else, I mean, not even number wise, but if they felt well, they could do what they wanted to do, they were healthy, not overweight. You wouldn't worry about the what else are you going to do? Sure. You know, I put them on, listen, <laughs> the numbers will make or break your day. I realize that. And, and I know you're going to feel better if your numbers are normal. And for sometimes that's why I prescribe statins. I try and resist. You know, I try and give you the education that you need, but you no, know, I realize it. You know, to have a high cholesterol will make or break your day, and, and lowering your cholesterol will make your day. I know that. So, how can I lower your cholesterol? Well, Let's see, I can give you niacin, which is a vitamin supplement, which is dangerous. Increases the risk of strokes. Uh, it turns you flushed, but it was the treatment we used 60, 70 years ago. I can give you uh, uh, bile acid sequestering agents like Questran or, or Cholestin. By the way, I think that is probably- I don't remember when that was the only thing there was. But see, in that way, you actually remove cholesterol from the body because Questran and Cholestin they grab a hold of the cholesterol in your gut or the bile acids in your gut, which are made from cholesterol, and they actually pull the cholesterol out of their tissues. And that way, that, that particular drug may actually benefit the disease. Okay. So I can give you berberine, I can give you niacin, I can give you uh, bile acid sequestering agents, I can give you uh, I can give you statins, a whole variety of statins. I can give you the new drugs that cost $12,000 a year, which are SGKP, I don't know what. <laughs> anyway, they're, they're brand new drugs that just came out, which, which lower cholesterol dramatically. But the result is we don't see the benefits in proportion to the drops in cholesterol, unless it's accomplished with a good diet. In other words, today, if you look up the research on statins, you'll see the vast majority of opinion among scientists, medical doctors, is that statins are, have been oversold they have minimal amount of benefit. You know, hardly anything. You've got to work really hard to show that they help at all. And they only help in people who are really sick. All right. Did I go enough on that cholesterol? Yet? <laughs> no, that was perfect. Yes, thank you. Right. Okay, next question. This is from Titi. She would like to know what can be done for a frozen shoulder. Oh, exercise. Exercise. So. Well, how about steroid shots? Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, you you first have to try. I I, 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 can, I, I would see speak. somebody besides Doctor John McDougal for sure. <laughs> I, I I think physical therapy would be reasonable, and I I only half joke about getting steroid shots because this is the way I used <laughs> that's, to practice. That's the way they used to do it. Yeah, I, I bet I shot your dad up in his shoulder maybe three four times well, by yeah. ten. Was, her dad was a carpenter. Mm -hmm. and, and I would tell mom and dad, your grandma and grandpa, whatever, I would tell them, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to give you a steroid shot. Oh, come on, please, please. It really helps. And so I ended up giving them like three times as much steroid shots as, as any reasonable doctor would <laughs> because they, they, they begged. But it worked. Well, that it, was the problem. It, it worked. Yeah. But it, it worried me because, you know, you inject steroids into somebody's joints and you can destroy the tendons. Uh, there, there are a lot of side effects to doing this, but any goes to that. Anyway, you could do that for a frozen shoulder. I'm sure there's some doctors out there that are doing it. I don't think it's a good idea. See a physical therapist. Um, but I, otherwise, I don't know of any, unless it's an acute inflammatory problem. If it's frozen because it has chronic disease, you know, scar tissue, or destroyed joints, that's one thing. 
But if the, it's frozen because you're having an acute attack because of the food you eat, that's reversible by eating a healthy diet. Or if it's painful and frozen because you've been overworking it, some rest would help. So there's some things you can try short of having steroid shots, having surgery done. Even, you know, I, I would encourage you to see somebody who's an expert in this particular problem. And, you know, maybe a chiropractor. Maybe a chiropractor would do Somebody has some good chiropractors out there. Of course, there are some good doctors out there too, Heather. <laughs> Lots, yes. Yeah, Thank lots. Of, yeah, right. <laughs> if you want to join join the team of being a good guy, then think of your patients first, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, who are in the medical profession, think of your patients first. They want to be well. They don't want to be drugged. They don't want to be operated on. They don't want to spend their retirement money on big treatments. They want to be well. So, you know, you say, well, nobody will do this. Well, yes, they will. Yes, well, only maybe if only if one one in ten people did it, that'd be better than you're doing now at helping people. Come on, guys and girls, <laughs> you know you, you took the you know you took the same oath I did. You know that you'll do no harm. That the patient was number you took that same oath. But it's easy to forget when it, when the money comes comes up. Yes, it's a. Doctors make a lot of money. <laughs> and if you're a specialist, you make a half a million to a million a year. What are you thinking? Yeah. Next question. <laughs> okay, next question. This is from Peter. Um, he's here every Sunday. He I, Apparently he has a brother that has chronic kidney disease. He's following the diet, but he's serious, severely underweight. So he's wondering if adding oils to the diet would be a good idea for extra calories or what would you suggest? Well, oil may be a way to go because you're adding calories without protein or potassium. So, you know, but I think simple sugar would be the best thing to do uh, because that gives you a lot safer calories. Like dried fruit? Well, you get oh, a lot yeah. of potassium. Oh, do you? Oh, okay. So the the table sugar, but oil might be well well tolerable. I I think what 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 I would do with the brother is I would sit him down and say what what things do you like? I mean, you get all the grains. You get uh, corn, rice. Just, anyway, you get all the grains. Uh, let's 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 realize that. What what kind of meal plan do you want to have? What kind of starch meal plan do you want to have? And then you know let's maybe you like oatmeal. You know, like sugar on your oatmeal. Well, we have two or three tablespoons of sugar in your oatmeal. See if we can get the calories up that way before we go to the oils. But yeah, that would probably be a good step to take. Okay, I thank you. I can't think of any negative impact on the acute problem getting disease. Okay, next question. Uh, do you need to limit the amount of yams that you eat because of beta carotene? Oh no! <laughs> unless, you don't, unless you don't like the orange color. <laughs> well, do you think? Do, do you think maybe today we were eating uh, purple sweet potatoes? Oh, and that's what we were that's showing we were up like orange now. <laughs> no, you can't eat that many sweet. We have to eat an awful lot. You'd have, you'd have to eat a lot of carrots and stuff. My my dad was a pilot in World War II, and uh, you know, he, he used to talk about all the time how they his fellow pilots would just eat carrots all day long with the idea that they carried to improve their eyesight. And they would develop keratinemia, which is an orange discoloration, which is never toxic, never an adverse effect, except your orange. Is that what our friend Jan, that orange? Oh, yeah. Because she ate, <laughs> she ate so many carrots. So, no, it's not toxic. Uh, keratinemia, which is conditioned due to eating a lot of beta keratin. Now, Beta carotene is never toxic. That's the plant form of vitamin A. But retinol, retinol is the animal form of vitamin A. Beta carotene is a precursor to retinol. Animals easily convert the plant beta carotene into the active form of vitamin A for their bodies. Vitamin A is extremely toxic. Uh, we see that in people who eat polar bear livers. They develop but you never heard that? Uh, no, I didn't know anybody. Yeah, well, people eat polar bear livers because they have a high, high amount of, of beta carotene. 
they develop, uh, I'm not beta carotene, excuse me, retinol. They develop uh, vitamin A toxicity, which is a pretty serious thing. I think that's but well, what about, I remember, well, it's been a few years ago now that there used to be a big deal about um, retinol as being good for wrinkles and stuff. Well, that's retin-A. Oh, that's right. That's not, not the same thing. Oh, it is. It's, it's a retinol product, yeah. So yeah. that comes from animals? I don't know where they get it from, but it's it's the animal form of vitamin A. It's not a beta carotene thing. It's a uh, retin A is a retinol. I haven't heard much about it lately. So it's, it's, I think it's good stuff. Okay. Uh, I think it's uh, it, uh, it's one way to treat your skin in a relatively safe way with retin A. Okay. Still use it. I, I personally don't use it, but I can see the patients still use it. Okay, next question. This is about bread. Uh, mainly Ezekiel bread. Is that an okay brand to eat? Yeah, as far as I know. I mean, all the Ezekiel um, varieties that I've looked at, most of them are sold in the freezer section of the supermarket because they're, they're, uh, they don't have any preservatives in them, so it's hard for them to be shipped around the country. So they have to freeze them, and that way they can ship them all around. So it, it's usually made from sprouted grains. So they're usually a little bit sweeter and they're made from all whole grains. Okay, thank you. How about, uh, this question is from Carol. What is the latest word on erythritol as a sugar substitute? I, I haven't kept up with it. I know it was in the paper about two months ago that it had an increased risk of cancer associated with it. So, hey, we recommend sugar, <laughs> excuse me. You know, uh, this is really hard for a lot of you, or some of you who are new to this. Sugar is not the problem, ladies and gentlemen. It rots your teeth. It raises your triglycerides. It's empty calories. But it's not the culprit that it's made out to be. And when you take it, you say sugar, and people think about potatoes and rice and corn and sweet potatoes, then they're 100% wrong. And they, they do, they mix up the two all the time. But even so, you know, table sugar tastes better than I'm sure erythra, whatever it's called. It tastes better than every artificial sweetener I've ever tried. That stuff is yuck. So um, put a couple teaspoons or half a teaspoon of sugar on yours or a teaspoon, little, little. Oh. Well, you know, I, I always like this, the, the story you tell about the people they go up to the counter in the fast food restaurant right. and, and order a double cheeseburger and fries and a Diet Coke. They always get a Diet Coke. You never miss a Diet Coke. If you look at that person in front of you or behind you, they're big, they're really <laughs> big. And they always order a diet drink. Oh. Diet drinks are not the solution to the problem. Sugar is not turned into fat in any significant amount. It's called de novo lipogenesis. A whole section on it in several of the books I've written, including the starch solution. De novo lipogenesis is insignificant in the human being. In other words, the conversion of sugar into fat is insignificant in the human being. They're lying to you. <laughs> but you're right. You're right. It's uh, sugar's not the problem, but it's it's not healthy for you. Thank you. Yeah, we're talking about brown sugar, maple syrup, you know, molasses. We're talking about all kinds of simple sugar. It's not not just what like cable sugar. Is. You, you don't solve the problem by eating brown sugar. Don't kid yourself. Or date paste. Yeah. <laughs> but but, you know, you but just, those are no, more natural, I guess. But you know, we, we don't want to have a meal plan that people have to apologize for or dread looking forward to it. And you know, Heather, you know, and so do you know hundreds of thousands of people out there that have taken our meal plan seriously. Is this is the best food available? You don't have the disgusting dead animals in there. Think about it, folks. You can't eat boiled beef or boiled chicken. You've got to cover it up with salt, sugar, and spice. These spices are made of vegetable ingredients. Or you can't eat it. You put steak sauce on it. Sweet and sour sauce, barbecue sauce. Or you can't get it down. We just get rid of that disgusting animal food. And the oils... How many, everybody tells me they love olive oil. Okay, okay. When we get done with this broadcast, you go to the kitchen cupboard and you take your bottle of olive oil out and you pour yourself a glass. 
drink it. <laughs> Come on. Oh, you better do it in the bathroom because you'll quickly be throwing up. So we leave out the oil. We leave out the disgusting animal foods or at least bland tasting. And all the other ingredients that you love, you know, the smells, the taste, everything is in the food that we recommend. You give up nothing but the battle of the bulge and a lifetime of sickness when you learn this. Get too enthused. <laughs> <laughs> that always, <Yeah. laughs> always. I will. Okay, next question. This is from Nicole. She wants to know how many grams of protein we should shoot for every day. Okay, it depends on uh, it depends on who you are and what size you are, and whether you're an athlete, or whether you're active, and so on. It depends on a lot of things. So I don't look at it in terms of grams. I like it in terms of percent of calories. Like for example. Pregnant women need more protein to grow the baby. Well, pregnant women, as I remember, are ravenously hungry. They eat a lot more food, so they take in more protein. But the protein intake for a pregnant woman, according to the World Health Organization, is somewhere between 5 and 6% of the total calories have to be protein. You know, which is pretty close to what, what you really need, which is somewhere between 3 to 5% of your diet as protein. All right, so you're an athlete, okay? The athletes think they need so much more protein for the muscles, et cetera. What do athletes do? They eat more food, so they eat more protein. The point being is that if you look at it in terms of percent calories, all right, so say your diet is 5% protein, okay? You're sedentary, you eat 1,000 calories a day. 5% is what? 50 calories, okay? So 50 calories of protein. You say, well, how do I convert that to grams? Well, there are four calories <laughs> in every gram. So you divide 50 by four, which is what? A little over 12, right? That's the bad. I can't do that. I can't. <laughs> I, I hardly do it to you. Okay. So it, it, it's, it is more accurate, more usable, more understandable, more correct to look at it in terms of not grams, but percent. Because that's what you need is you're very active like an athlete or a pregnant woman. Do you, think, go, do you really think anybody would eat would eat a protein deficient diet without even thinking about it? I never I mean, seen. I it. never think about how much protein I'm getting in a day. It's never been reported in the entire world literature. Nobody's ever seen it. Nobody has seen protein deficiency except during starvation. It's never been described. But yeah. people talk about it all. Well, you go into the grocery store. You hear all these experts out here. The first thing they tell you is protein. Protein is the most dangerous nutrient there is. I mean, start by the fact that you know those people with protein deficiency. Come on. <laughs> Think about it. Protein excess, yes. You get osteoporosis, kidney stones, damage to the kidneys, damage to the liver. Yes, you do. But deficiency, you ever seen it? Okay, so you've never seen it, yet the entire nutritional business is based on getting more protein. Don't you think there's something wrong here? And destroy the planet. You want to pick a nutrient, destroy our planet, pick protein. You've heard that the animal agricultural business contributes more than half of our greenhouse gases. More than half. That's protein, protein, protein. Kill you and the planet and your future and your children. Get carried away again on that. Oh, of course. <laughs> Nobody okay. can ever hurt, accuse you of not being. Enthusiastic. Well, I'll try. Passionate. Yes. Okay. Next question. Is a sigmoidoscopy just as effective as a colonoscopy in discovering cancers or other abnormalities? Okay. No. Colonoscopy is going to find more abnormalities and more tumors. But this is the There's always a but. This is the big but. Uh, colonoscopy, they lose, use a six to eight foot tube. They have to take this tube 68 feet and they have to go through all kinds of twists and turns. You go up the sigmoid, then up the descending, then down the transverse, then down the ascending. Okay, let's go in the other direction. Up the ascending, over the transverse, and down the descending into the sigmoid and out into the toilet. All right, you've got to go through all these curves to find the tumors. Well, if you look at more follow, you find more tumor. But the problem is, it's only tumors found within the first two feet within reach of the sigmoid 
that when you take them out, you can make a difference in terms of survival. One of the reasons you can't is that tumors on the right side, in other words, the ones the colonoscopy can reach, they, they are either too far gone or they're not amenable to therapy or, or when you add up the mortality, you just killed a whole bunch of people by sticking this tube up their butt, you perforated their colon, you caused bleeding, you killed a bunch of people. So even if you saved a few because you did a colonoscopy, Anyways, the NORID study, which was just published October 22nd, 2022, which is the first randomized controlled trial. I'll talk about that. I'll get a few slides together next time. Because I wanted to show those slides to people. I'll, I'll try and do that next time. Show there's no survival benefit for getting colonoscopy. The, the, the only, only randomized controlled trial shows no benefit. However, there's good reason to believe that doing a sigmoid actually does. It does because it takes off precancerous lesions, a sigmoid without killing. No one dies from the sigmoid. People die from colonoscopies. So you don't have that, that detraction from your total statistics. You just get the people you save by taking out precancerous lesions with a sigmoid. There so you'd go. rather... Yeah. You'd recommend the sigmoid anyway. Yeah, I recommend the... one sigmoid, one sigmoid between the ages of 60 and 75. Why not younger than 60? Because colon cancer is so rare. Why over 75? Because you're not going to live long enough to appreciate the benefits. One sigmoid. Or, or, and or, you could do both if you want. Check your stool. Check it for blood. Uh, check it for... Uh, you know, the genetic, people, how about the genetics? The Cologuard, yeah, the Cologuard would be fine. You know, you, you could do that. You check it, you know, once or two or three times, and you know, few, few, it costs like four to twenty dollars to do that test. A sigmoid is two hundred dollars. Like colonoscopies, three thousand and six dollars. <laughs> That's what they cost on average. You know. Did I answer the question? I think so. You did. Yes. Hey, and I don't want to forget what you put in your colon depends upon whether it gets colon cancer or not. <laughs> Guess what? Uh, the American diet causes colon cancer. It doesn't exist. No such thing in populations that live on starch based diets. It was non existent in Africa before 1970. No colon cancer before 1970 in rural Africa. I bet they got a lot today. <laughs> okay, thank you. Next question. What foods help lower blood pressure? Uh, just the basic stuff. Just, I mean, just the foods we recommend, yeah, right? Just the food we recommend. <laughs> Why? Because part of the blood pressure thing, you know, the, the lecture I tried to show you, you saw all the, all the blood cells stuck together. You saw the blockages that occur in the arteries. Well, what happens, the reason the pressure goes up is because you have all this resistance to flow. Peripheral resistance is called. So your heart tries to pump oxygen and nutrients into your tissues, but because the blood is all sludged, remember I showed you at the beginning of this hour, the blood is all sludged. The arteries are in spasm. They're full of plaques. The, the heart needs resistance to flow and it has to increase the pressure to deliver the nutrients to the tissues immediately we stop the sludging. Stops within 10 hours of, of not eating the fat. And by the way, vegetable fat causes sludging as severe, more severe than animal fat does. Keep that in mind. So uh, we open up the bed, blood pressure drops, we stop the drugs, we get, well, our results are nearly 90% of our patients get off or reduce their blood pressure medications. But within the time they stay with us. We get them off their drugs. Three, they're on three, four, five drugs at a time. And they leave with a better blood pressure when they came in. So, yeah, it's the diet. A little exercise helps, weight loss helps. But, you know, you get the, what did I, did I say? You get the benefits in four to seven days. Did I say that? <laughs> you know, if you're not better in four months, go listen to somebody else. Excuse me, if you want to get well, if you want to test Mary and John and Heather, you got, you got seven days between the next time we get together. You know, we're going to meet you on Saturday night, Sunday, Sunday. night, five o'clock Pacific time, and you're friends. You want to do the test between now and then, or any of you listen who are naive to this, just give us a week. 
see what happens. Report. I know what's going to happen. I've taken care of 12,000 people. I know what's going to happen. Or you're not doing it. It's pretty amazing. There's all sorts of people commenting in the chat about how the McDougal program has changed their life. Yeah. Well, you know, Heather, it, it's nice. You know, I've I said this many times. You know, I, I, I could live with you coming to me, coming to me and saying, you know, I heard what you said, but I couldn't do it. It's just too hard, et cetera. But I never wanted somebody to come to me and say, I heard what you said, and it's not true. It didn't work. And I've been doing this for 48 years now. You know, I can't remember a time when anybody's come to me and said, I listened to your advice. It's a bunch of BS. You know, you couldn't do it. I know you couldn't do it. <laughs> you know, getting your health back it sometimes takes some effort, a lot less than you think. And we're going to help you. What's our next 12-day program? Buddy? July 14th. So you sign yeah. up. Dr. Lim and I will take good care of all the rest of our staff. Uh, we will change your life. I'd love to say guaranteed. I almost could say guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I really, I feel, I felt all along that that wouldn't be a bad thing to do, but I know some people would feel figure out how to cheat the system. Oh, and, but, you know, so I'm not going to say it's guaranteed, but I can tell you our results, which are published and unquestioned. You can look them up. Pretty amazing. The name's McDougal. Look it up. <laughs> Okay, we've run out of time. Anything you want to share in our well, last couple of minutes? I'm going to spend the next couple of days talking to the people who I bought this camera from. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm sure it's going to be a great camera when I finally get it worked out. I have no idea why PowerPoint acted the way it did. Folks, I've been electronically challenged. <laughs> yep, tonight was not a night for technology, but that's okay. Great content, lots of questions answered. So thanks, Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougal and Mary. Hey, all right, thanks. thank you. We will talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone, for being here. See you all next Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific.